Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Abhas, and with me here is Team 19876, N-1 from the Chesapeake region. They competed in early January, ending as the winning Lions captain of their qualifier, and they currently have a top 100 OPR, looking to bump it up just a little bit at their qualifier next weekend and the Chesapeake Championship on February 3rd. They have a really, really awesome robot, great use of 3D printed parts, and just effective design overall, so we're going to get into that and more coming up on First Updates Now. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineered their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Okay guys, let's uh, get started with your intake. So, you know, you guys have that surgical tubing intake, I believe, and it's just really, really effective. Why don't we walk through it, how it works, and, uh, you know, how it's gone throughout the season. Sure. Our intake system is modeled after a lint roller with the ability to intake pixels across the entire length of the robot. As pixels are intake, as pixels are intake, they're carried through a belt system, which will carry the pixels throughout the entire robot all the way to the outtake system. However, this belt system did have some of its problems of its own, as sometimes the belts would get offset when the pixel would strike it. Thus, we developed this comb piece wherein each belt would fit in between it, which would help prevent the belts from being offset when struck. There are also these little beads underneath each belt to help prevent this effect further. I see, yeah. Do you think we could see like up close your intake, um, what it looks like from the front? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, and so, you know, one question I had for you guys with this, was a surgical tubing like lint roller intake, as you mentioned, the first thing you guys wanted to do as the game came out, or was this like one of many ideas and then you eventually settled on this? So the day the game came out, we actually hypothesized of different ideas, but then we eventually decided on a lint roller. Mm -hmm. Here's the intake mech at work right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I see a couple things. You guys also have those horizontally spinning uh, surgical tubing uh, noodles, right, attached with those be uh, like on the bevel geared shafts. So how have those been working out for you? Is that something you decided to add like with the first design of the intake or it was an iteration that was later added on? Uh, we noticed that it was a little bit hard for our robot to grab pixels from the corners. So we added those. So if there are pixels just beyond the outside reach of the robot, it hit them towards the intake. And then the main intake system will catch on to it and bring in another robot. Got it. Yeah. And so now talking about your deposit, I think one of the first things I saw about it that was pretty interesting is most teams tend to have their deposits like centered right in the robot. But, you know, you guys have it offset a little bit uh, to the right or left, you know, and um, it, it's pretty interesting. So walk me through that decision. Was that just as a result of the design or was it intentional? How did that happen? So we first designed our comb piece and then we worked our intake system around that. But we wanted to be able to intake across the entire length of the robot. So Mimi here designed a nice funnel piece. Mimi, you want to go into depth about that? Right. So in order to funnel the pixels from the entire width of the robot to our outtake mechanism, we needed to have some sort of funnel. So we designed a, a funnel piece that goes right inside the robot right here. And it just carries the pieces up and into the right direction along the conveyor belts. Mm -hmm. And so now once your pixels are in your deposit, what is the next step? Do you guys pick them up from like some resting place or is your deposit like the same um, mechanism or object that you use to then drop the pixels? Right. So the intake takes it right and deposits it onto our pixel tray. Mm -hmm. Right. And then two servos clamp down on the pixels, which allows us to raise the arm to the correct height and release the pixels either individually or simultaneously. Sure. And so has this pixel tray and like deposit mechanism with the two servo clamping gone and gone through any iterations this season or really you haven't had any issues and you didn't need to make any changes to it? It has definitely gone through many iterations. We started with a popsicle stick design with um, binder clips and then we finally decided to um, 
after many different 3D prints and designs to go with the current one that we have. Got it. Yeah. And so now going on to your deposit, uh, like the linear slide system itself, I know something, again, a lot of teams do is run the dual linear slides, right, on the left and right side of the robot. But you and a few other teams I've seen this season have very successfully just run one set of slides. So again, what was the motivation behind this decision? Do you guys have any plans in the future to switch to a dual setup or is this really good enough for now? Yeah, so I think because of uh, space constraints, because we want to keep our robot like as thin as possible. So that's why there's only one set of slides, because if we put another one over here, it would be like there wouldn't be enough space for it with the wheel and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we actually had to um, do some basically uh, counterbalancing here with uh, this uh, uh, tensioner to keep it like it sort of keeps it from sagging to one side or the other. I see because it's only supported on one side. Right, and so those are just Gobilda Viper slides, and what gear ratio are you running them at? Yeah, they're the they're the shorter Gobilda Steel Viper slides, 435 RPM. Okay, yeah. And, uh, you know, as far as programming goes behind, behind this whole system, what sensors are you guys using in your whole pixel path, you know, from intake to depositing? Uh, walk me through that. So being with the intake, there's just standard control um, the driver um, controls directly the intake. What well, automation we have over here is that there is a color sensor in the pixel tray. There's a hole in the pixel tray, and then there's a color sensor right through, and that will be detecting if there's a pixel in or not. And based on that, there can be automation where these lights come on, and then we can auto clamp the the servos. Um, more generally speaking, on the robot for movement, we add odometry pods that serve as sensors for our autonomous program, and then we use a the inbuilt timer and the IMU, IMU orientation, and motor encoders as to assert or as sensors to sort of guide our guide yeah. our system. And so, uh, you know, you mentioned the color sensor indicates when you have uh, pixels, and so so you guys have like some sort of uh, LED indicator on your robot as well. Yes, yeah. right okay. here. Okay. So I see. As, as you can see, there's a pixel right here, and there's also the red LED is on. And so do you use this also to indicate to your human player what pixels you want to pick up? Or is that just something that's not needed right now for you guys? So right now we only have LEDs that can do one color, which is um, not ideal because we definitely eventually want to actually display the color. And so that way dri the driver has more information to work with. Mm -hmm. But that's something we're planning to add in the future. And right now we're just using our single color LEDs. Okay, yeah, no. And you know, now I wanna get into your guys' end game period because you have some really awesome mechanisms. Uh, so let's just start with your hang. I just, I'm all ears, let's hear about it. Yeah, so uh, as you see here, this is our hang mechanism. And so basically how this works is this is a set of carbon fiber uh, telescoping rods that are surrounded by a compacted spring so that when we release this trigger mechanism, it goes up to the correct height. So let's do that really quick. Oh yeah, wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, as you saw, it goes up to the right height and then uh, we're able to get um, the pull over this hook and then we basically pull it down uh, from a string that's connected to a winch at the bottom of our robot. Oh, wow. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, one, one question about that. Uh, with the winch, where does the extra string uh, that's, uh, you know, associated with the hang stored? Is, is it just spooled up and you unravel it as your hang goes up? Is it just like kept in a box somewhere? What does that look like? Oh, yeah. Uh, sure. Can we turn off the robot really quick? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, basically, uh, when this is compacted, here, can you hold this? So yeah, when this is compacted, that can come over. So we basically just uh, use uh, some different uh, clips to hold the string in place. So basically just wraps around some strategical points around our robot. And then, so when it's pulled up, uh, they're quickly like, they're like jerked out of the- um, Magnets, the magnets. It. Yeah. Oh, so it's magnetically, like the string is clamped between some magnets or something? Yeah, here one second. I can do one for you really quick. Okay. In addition to that, in general, we just have a pulley attached to the motor, which, which sort of spools in the string as well. I see. Oh, so it's a motor that spools up um, yep. the hang. I see. And so with this with this magnet mechanism, have you had any instances in which you have uh, like false releases because you get hit really hard or anything like that, or it really hasn't been an issue this season? 
Uh, we had one time when it, like, didn't release, and I think that was, like, we released it and the arm didn't go up all the way. Mm -hmm. And I think that was due to some spring issues, because we were using some pretty weird springs at that point, but we've upgraded since then. I see. I see. Um, yeah, and again, like, with this, has this magnet, like, detachment mechanism gone through iterations throughout the season, or really, like, your first attempt at it was pretty good? Uh, we had to change the location a few times to be able to change the amount of string that uh, was wrapped around our robot. And so we changed the placement a few different times to be able to affect that. So yeah, as you see here, the string's wrapped around through our robot and you'll see it come apart when I launch it. Okay, yeah, awesome. That's That's really cool. And so now the last question I have for you guys with the robot is the drone mechanism. I see you guys have a pretty really good display of drones right over there. Can you walk us through what your drone mechanism is? Has it gone through any iterations throughout the season? So on and so forth. So our launching mechanism itself is controlled. Can you hold this for me? It's controlled by a system of levers attached to a servo. The levers allow for us to build a lot of tension, but even it out so that a single weak servo is able to hold it. And then we were able to fit the paper airplane in. And our paper airplane is folded in a unique way that it's top heavy while also having a windmill design on the back. The windmill design induces spin on the drone. And when it's spinning by the law of conservation of angular momentum, there won't be that much of an impact from external forces, thus allowing for more reliable flight. So when you load a paper airplane in, if I let go of the shooting mechanism, it spins in air and it flies really reliably. Wow. Yeah. And as far as competition performance, what have you guys found? I know you've only had qualifier so far but you know just in those six to ten matches what what what, what was it looking for? so at both of our qualifiers the air density of the building we participate in always varies so the launching distance will vary but after one or two matches we were able to gauge like where should we uh place the robot on the field before we launch and we're able to perfect that usually by the end of the tournament Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, my last question for you guys for this interview is you have your Chesapeake Regional coming up in about two weeks. You know, it's always very tough to advance out of Chesapeake, some really tough teams. And I remember last year you guys had a very deep run uh, in your division. So for this season, uh, you know, are, are there any changes you plan on making to your robot or is it really just refinement and practice? There's definitely some changes we wish to make because there's obviously things we can improve. One major point we want to improve on is our auto. Right now, we have a really reliable 50-point auto, but we're also in the works of getting a cycling auto as well. In addition to that, we just want to keep practicing and keep making refinements um, as we think that's really essential to having a good run. Yeah, awesome, guys. So, Ed Minus One, thank you so much. This has really been a great interview. You guys' mechanisms are always so innovative and effective at the same time. So, thank you so much for this interview. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Abhas, and this is Team Ed Minus One, 19876. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Most live shows can be found on the First Updates Now YouTube channel, live competitions at twitch.tv slash firstupdatesnow, and join our Discord at discord.gg slash firstupdatesnow. Check out our social offerings on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.